it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Weiss. Uh, she received her uh, PhD in microbiology and medical genetics from Harvard University. She started study of coronaviruses actually as a postdoc at the University of California, San Francisco. She's currently a professor and vice chair of microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania, Perelman School of Medicine and co-director of a newly established uh, center for research on coronaviruses and other emerging uh, pathogens. So today she'll be talking about coronaviruses, history, life cycle, and innate immune mechanisms. And thank you very much, Dr. Weiss. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. So this is meant to be an introductory lecture to coronaviruses. And as Sharon said, I'll first discuss the history, um, then uh, briefly discuss replication, trying to point out places in the virus life cycle that will provide uh, potential targets for uh, antivirals that may be effective against uh, many, if not all, coronaviruses. And then the last part, I'm going to talk about innate immune antagonism with some data from my own lab. So coronaviruses are members of the nidovirus superfamily. Uh, nidoviruses are named for the nested subgenomic RNAs generated during infection, and I'll talk about those in more detail later. They're envelope viruses about medium size, 100 to 150 nanometers, and they all have single-stranded positive sense RNA genomes, which means that their genomes actually serve as messenger RNAs. And I'll talk about that again more later as well. So here's a picture of coronavirus. You can see it in the electron microscope. It has this crown-like morphology, and hence the name coronavirus. Um, and then these other viruses are also um, members of the nidovirus group. So here's a picture of the coronavirus uh, virion. It's actually pretty simple. There's a very long RNA of 30 kilobases, the longest known RNA genome. It's capped and polyadenylated like other messenger RNAs, and um, it's combined with nucleocapsid protein and in a helical nucleocapsid forms the viral nucleocapsid or the core of the virus. And around the nucleocapsid is the membrane here that's derived from the host cell membrane. And um, in the membrane, there are three uh, proteins. The spike protein, the most famous protein of coronavirus that everybody's been talking about, um, the spike protein uh, mediates viral entry, uh, so binds to its receptor and mediates virus cell fusion. Um, it's, it's a major determinant of tropism, immune response, and also virulence. But also in, this, in the membrane are two other proteins, the membrane protein, transmembrane protein, and the small membrane protein. Both also have important functions. Coronavirus research before 2002 focused on uh, mostly on murine coronavirus, MHV. My lab worked on that for a very long time. It was isolated in 1949, and it provides a model for hepatitis, encephalitis, and chronic demyelinating diseases. It's often been used as a model for multiple sclerosis. So a lot of the research on the molecular biology of, of coronaviruses that really taught us a lot and was important in understanding the SARS and MERS and the more virulent viruses was done with, with MHV. Um, in addition, there was a lot of studies on the animal coronaviruses, which are important pathogens of pigs, cows, cats, birds, just about any species you can think of. And, and there was a lot of vaccine development done for these pathogens. Some of them also like IBV of birds and um, BCV of cows were also used for the molecular biology studies in, in the early parts of coronavirus research. So also before 2002, we knew uh, many types of diseases to be caused by coronaviruses. Respiratory diseases, we knew about these cold viruses, OC43 and 229E. We knew about avian infectious bronchitis virus and bovine coronavirus. Uh, central nervous system disease was caused by the neurotropic MHV, um, which, as I said, caused encephalitis and demyelination. And in the early days, people looked very hard for an association between coronaviruses and multiple sclerosis, but it was uh, not, not found to be the case. Um, some coronaviruses, some MHV strains cause hepatitis. And um, there are some GI infections, porcine transmissible gastroenteritis virus, avian IBV, bovine coronavirus, mouse hepatitis stra strains, the strains that, um, that wreak havoc in animal colonies, and feline coronavirus. Um, there's also a feline coronavirus that uh, causes peritonitis. This is a really lethal virus called FIPV. So this is all before we knew about SARS and MERS. Um, and then uh, just to show you a coronavirus timeline, 
uh, of human coronaviruses. So, um, I so during this period, as I just said, from the 60s until now, people have used MHV as a model coronavirus and also quite studied quite a lot the animal viruses uh, from a vaccine perspective. And there were the human cold viruses, although there was not very much work done on those viruses. Um, as early as the 60s, uh, we knew about OC43 and 229E that caused the common cold. OC43 can also occasionally infect the lower respiratory tract, but nobody worried too much about those viruses. Nobody thought a lot about coronaviruses until SARS in 2002, um, and that began the, the era of what I call pathogenic human coronaviruses. Um, and soon after SARS, um, people looked for other coronaviruses and found HKU1 and NL63. These are both human viruses that are less lethal than SARS, but, um, but cause more severe disease, disease than the cold viruses. Uh, they cause pneumonia um, and bronchiolitis or croup, respectively. So also at this time, it became clear that coronaviruses were found in bat species and that the, the precursor virus to SARS was, was probably, well, was, came from a bat. Um, and then things were pretty quiet in coronavirus research until 2012 when Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus emerged in the Middle East. Um, and then again, things were really kind of quiet until the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, when SARS coronavirus 2 emerged again um, in China. And just to be clear, SARS, -COVID, SARS coronavirus, the original one, MERS coronavirus, and SARS coronavirus 2 all caused similar severe respiratory disease. And again, coronavirus disease 219 or COVID-19 is, is the name of the disease. The virus is actually called SARS-CoV-2. A lot of times the virus is referred to as COVID-19, but that's really not its correct name. Um, okay, just for a little more history, the first coronavirus international meeting was held in Germany in 1980. Um, I actually went to that meeting. There were about 60 people at that meeting. Um, and then we had this meeting every three years or so. And then the 10th International Coronavirus Meeting was held in the Netherlands uh, right after SARS emerged. And this meeting was hugely well attend attended. Um, and interestingly, um, there was a meeting uh, supposed to meet this month, the 15th International Coronavirus Meeting in the same place in the Netherlands, which I think is kind of um, eerie. And this meeting had to be postponed because, because of SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about each epidemic. So SARS coronavirus interspecies transmission, as I said, SARS coronavirus originated in a bat, was transmitted to a civet, um, and then to a human. And then once in humans, SARS coronavirus spread very quickly by close human to human contact, and it really spread all over the world, but mostly in, it was mostly found in China, in Hong Kong. There was a, uh, an epidemic also in Toronto, but it mostly stayed uh, restricted to Asia. It was over in eight months. There were about 8,000 infections with close to 10% mortality. 87% was found in China and Hong Kong. And we don't really know how many times did this happen. Did this happen only once or did it happen more than once? And are there, are there transmissions, transmissions that we don't really know about because people didn't get very sick? MERS coronavirus was similar but different. It also originated in a bat and was transmitted to a camel. And it also is, is there's a lot of camel to camel transmission and it, it really is a reservoir in camels. Many camels, both in the Middle East and Africa, um, have MERS infections. It, was, it can be transferred then from a camel to a human. The camels get a cold and the humans get quite sick from it. Um, and there's a limited human-to-human -human spread. And um, most of this, these infections were in the Arabian Peninsula, except for an epidemic in Korea, which was started by someone traveling from Arabia um, to Korea. Um, this infection, uh, camels are a reservoir, so this is different. The civet was just probably a brief uh, uh, home for the uh, SARS, whereas the camel, the, the virus really has um, a reservoir of, of SARS, of, of MERS. And, um, there are still new cases of MERS as of 2020. There, there have been 2,500 cases. It has a very high mortality rate, um, but, um, but it, it uh, doesn't spread nearly as fast as SARS or SARS-CoV-2. It just kind of keeps um, causing new infections, but it seems restricted to the Middle East. And now we have SARS-CoV-2, which we believe has an origin in the bat, although the precursor virus has not been discovered or identified, and I'll talk about that more again. Um, it's transmitted to some, we think, to an intermediate species. It's been 
thought to be a pangolin, but this has not at all been, been verified. Um, and then to a human, and of course, as we all know, it spreads really quickly human to human. Um, and this time it didn't stay in Asia. It's like tra transmitted all over the world, as we all know, and we're all living with. Um, there have been 3 million infections, so hugely much more than SARS or MERS, uh, 200,000 deaths um, in the world. This is as of the end of April. And in the U.S. alone, 980,000 infections and 55,000 deaths. So this has obviously been much more devastating than either of the other two infections, although interestingly, the, the actual death rate per, uh, per person, per capita, is, is quite a bit lower than either of the other viruses. So cross-species infections with coronaviruses were really known pre-SARS. <clears throat> For example, the human OC43 is very closely related to the bovine coronavirus, and some people think that um, that the human virus evolved from the, from the cow virus. Um, the bovine vir virus also spread into alpaca and, and deer, and then adapted to these species, and now um, there are deer and uh, there are alpaca and deer coronaviruses. So this cross-species infection is kind of a trademark of coronaviruses and not specific to these lethal um, respiratory viruses. So we have questions, where did SARS-CoV-2 come from? What lineage of coronavirus is it from? What is its parental virus? And what is its intermediate species? And really, we've only asked, answered the first question, but I'll go through some of the data. This shows the genomes of the lineage of coronaviruses that uh, have human members. That would be the alpha coronaviruses, which contain 2290 and NL63, and then three lineages of beta coronaviruses, lineage A, B, and C. Um, the uh, lineage A contains OC43 and HKU1, lineage B contains SARS, and lineage C contains MERS. And the interesting thing here is that all coronaviruses have a, quite a similar genome organization. They all have a 20 kilobase long replicase uh, locus that encodes 16 non-structural proteins, and I'll talk about those in a lot more detail in a minute. They then have this, uh, the structural uh, genes, spike E, M, and N, all arrayed in the same order at the three prime end of the genome. And what distinguishes these lineages is these so-called accessory proteins that are encoded in these genes with numbers like 4A, 4B, uh, 2A, 4, 5A. And you can see that each lineage has a different group of structural proteins. And for the most part, they have no homology among the uh, lineages. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 was sequenced with an amazing speed after uh, first being identified. And it, um, I'll mention that in a moment. And clearly, it was very closely related to SARS-CoV-2 um, and is in this lineage here. The differences um, between the two viruses, there are some in the spike that I'll talk about, and there are also some in the accessory proteins that I'll get to at the end. And just two things to remember about coronaviruses that is they undergo discontinuous transcription, which I'll talk about later, and this leads to a high rate of recombination. So this can lead to new viruses. But on the other hand, the error rate for RNA replication is, resu is reduced compared to some other viruses because um, they, have a, they encode a proofreading enzyme called uh, XON or NSP14, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment too. So this, these are the genomes, and uh, this is where SARS-CoV-2 belongs. So early on, uh, some Zheng Li Shi, she's one of the uh, first people that isolated or identified bat SARS-like coronaviruses. Um, so she did a homology study where she compared the new virus to a bunch of other uh, lineage B uh, coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses. So um, the virus that most closely resembles the new virus SARS-CoV-2 is this bat coronavirus RATG13 that's shown in the blue. It's something like 96% homologous to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, these other viruses, SARS itself is down here. So there's quite a lot of difference between SARS and SARS-CoV-2 in the spike gene and in the uh, open, reading one fr open reading frame 1A. Um, there are other bat coronaviruses that are more closely related sh shown here. Um, so uh, also, here's a, a homology tree based on ORF1B, open reading from 1B, and we can see here that, that these are all the Wuhan isolates, the early SARS-CoV-2s, and they're all, they all group with this bat coronavirus RAT G, G, G13, and here it would be SARS coronavirus close, but not nearly as close, MERS coronavirus, OC43, and 229E, and uh, NL63. So they're all quite, um, you can see how they're all related, but, um, but it's clearly closest to SARS-CoV-2. 
So um, also, so let's look at the receptor. SARS-CoV receptor is ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme. Um, NL63 interestingly also uses ACE2 when it's much less virulent. So, so this just illustrates a sort of an obvious point in a way that the interaction with spike and receptor is not the only determinant of uh, pathogenesis. MERS coronavirus, on the other hand, uses a completely different receptor, dipeptidyl peptidase 4, DPP4. Um, and as I said, SARS-CoV-2 uses ACE2, the same receptor as SARS-CoV-1. Their spikes are 75% identical, but, uh, but the spike of SARS-CoV-2 is a bit longer, and it differs in some of the key residues of the receptor binding domain. So there's this question of whether it's still adapting to humans. We'll see. Um, and there's also data suggesting that the spike of SARS-CoV-2 binds more strongly to ACE2 than SARS-CoV-1. Not clear what that means. Okay, so let's look at the spike protein. So all coronavirus spike proteins are, are arrayed like this. They have two subunits, S1 and S2. And in order for them to be activated to activate, um, to cause cell virus fusion and entry, they have to be cleaved by proteases in two places, at this S1, S2 boundary, and at this S2 prime boundary. Um, this, this cleavage is right next to the fusion peptide, which mediates virus host fusion. So um, interestingly, there's, there's, this, uh, there's some coronaviruses have the so-called furin site at the S12 boundary, which just means that they can be cleaved by furin during assembly of the virus. Um, and a lot has been made of this furin site. So um, this new virus here, it's called N coronavirus, but this is SARS-CoV-2. It has a so-called furin site. But that the reason that that's of interest is that SARS and the SARS, uh, like bat viruses, are lacking this cleavage site whereas um, both the lineage A, HKU1, and uh, OC43 have the furin site, as does lineage C, MERS. So um, I think this is really interesting as a marker for maybe helping us identify a precursor virus. But for the moment, people have made, made a, a large deal about that. And, and in looking for uh, precursors, here again, here's a more simple diagram of the spike protein, the furin site, um, receptor binding domain, and um, S2 cleavage site. If we look at the pangolin virus, so the reason why people have been excited about the pangolin perhaps being a precursor is that the receptor binding domain is very similar to the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2. However, the rest of the spike protein is less related, it's 90% related, whereas uh, RATG13 is 96% uh, homologous in the spike, but it, um, but it has a, some differences in the receptor binding domain. And, but interestingly, neither one of these uh, proteins has the furin site. So neither one of these is clearly the precursor to this, to, this, uh, to this spike protein. So we really don't know if the pangolin is the, um, certainly this virus is not an immediate precursor to SARS-CoV-2. So there's still a search um, for the presumably the, the, uh, the bat precursor and also the intermediate species. So yeah, we don't know the bat ancestral virus for SARS-CoV-2 and what's the intermediate species. Um, we don't know. So th this is the origin of the outbreak was presumed to be in this Wuhan seafood market, but we don't really know that for sure. There are reports of um, earlier infections before uh, the infections that were associated with the market. And what factors drive spillover into humans? Is it just uh, the proximity of the bat to the intermediate species and the intermediate species to the human? We don't really know. And why did this take eight years uh, and 17 years to happen again after this first SARS? But we don't, we, we, or did it really? Were there other spillovers that we just didn't notice because the disease weren't that, um, uh, weren't that obvious or that virulent? when I want to talk about identification of potential targets for antiviral therapies. So here's a very simple diagram of coronavirus replication that we drew in 2005 after the SARS epidemic. Um, this is still correct, but there, we know a lot more than we show here. But, and this is actually for MHV in specific, but they're really all very similar. So um, the SARS coronavirus, the spike protein recognizes the receptor and the virus is internalized into the cell or the nucleocapsid is internalized uh, after a cell virus fusion. Um, the, the, the RNA is translated into a replicase protein here through these two very large proteins called polyprotein 1A, polyprotein 1A, 1B. The replicase then um, replicates the viral genome shown here 
and also uh, synthesizes a set of subgenomic mRNAs. This is all done through a negative strand intermediate, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But these um, messenger RNAs are translated into proteins. The, um, the membrane proteins are then inserted into intracytoplasmic membrane shown here in the ER. And, um, and then the, the viral RNA complexes with new nucleocapsid protein forming nucleocapsids. And these capsids bud into um, intracellular membranes somewhere between the uh, rough ER and the Golgi and the um, endoplasmic reticulum um, Golgi intermediate compartment shown here. They're then seen in vesicles, which transport the virus to the cell surface where it's released, and that's shown here. Um, at the same time, the spike proteins that are, that are also found in the cell membrane can mediate cell-to-cell -cell fusion, and that's another way the virus can spread. So I'm going to talk about two parts of replication uh, that are really present interesting targets for uh, antivirals, particularly uh, virals that might work against many coronaviruses, and that's um, entry and um, translation and replication proteins. So here's a, a picture of viral entry. There are two pathways of entry for coronaviruses. One is the endosomal route. During this pathway, the virus attaches to its receptor. And this is, this is kind of for SARS, ACE2. It's then um, endocytosed into a vesicle and then, um, and then released from the endosome uh, into the cytoplasm. And the way that this occurs is that the spike protein mediates a fusion between the endosomal membrane um, and, and the viral membrane. And in order for that to happen, the virus protein, the spike protein has to be activated um, by a protease cleavage that I mentioned before. And in this case, in this pathway, it's cathepsin is the protease that cleaves, that activates the spike to, to allow the internalization of the virus. And this um, requires the low pH um, environment of the endosome. The other pathway is a direct plasma membrane route, and in this uh, route, the virus attaches again to its receptor. Um, and in this case, it, it also needs to be um, have a protease cleavage, and that um, occurs, uh, by, for example, by TIMPERS, which is a membrane-associated protease. And then that again triggers fusion with the cell membrane, this time with the plasma membrane, and the, um, the virus or the nucleocapsid is released into the, into the cell. And um, the reason that, that's, that this is important and interesting is that um, which pathway used really depends on a combination of the protease sites available on the viral spike protein and the proteases available on the host cell. And that can vary depending on host, site, host and tissue type. And this is important to think about in designing antivirals because hydrochloroquine, for example, would only be targeting this pathway or cathepsin inhibitors would also target this pathway whereas um, TIMPERS inhibitor would be targeting this pathway. Furin inhibitor might also target this pathway because furin's an, um, an intracellular uh, enzyme protease that can kind of pre-activate the spike before it even gets um, into, the, into the, before it's even exported from the cell. So, some, so as I said, since viruses use both pathways, um, maybe both pathways need to be targeted to be sure to, to really prevent viral entry. So I'm gonna talk now about transcription of coronavirus messenger RNAs. So here's the viral genome. It's got a five prime cap and a three prime polyadenylated N, just like other messenger RNAs. It's got this so-called leader sequence of about 100 or so nucleotides. And these yellow um, spi st stripes here are TRS sequences or transcriptional regulatory sequences. And they signal the beginning of each, um, each messenger RNA or each open reading frame for translation. Um, but I'll show you what they do in a moment. Um, so the first thing that happens after infection is the uh, viral polymerase is translated from this genome RNA, an RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It then gets on the three prime end of the um, genome and, uh, and synthesizes a negative strand a copy of uh, the RNA. Um, the polymerase then copies back, and makes more um, genome RNA replication. At the same time, um, this, this replicase transcribes uh, subgenomic negative strands um, representing each mRNA, and those are then uh, copied back by the same polymerase into uh, plus strand mRNAs. So in the end, we have genome replication and the synthesis of many uh, plus strand RNAs. And this involves a really interesting and complicated process whereby the polymerase um, transcribes up until the first transcript TRS and then jumps to here to the leader 
where there's an homologous sequence and then makes this very small RNA here. And then in some cases, it will do the same thing, only jump from here or here or here, generating all these mRNAs with the same three prime sequences and the same five prime leader sequence. So this involves quite a, a, compl a complex of uh, proteins, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. RT-QPCR detection of coronavirus RNA. So this is how testing is done for infections with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and here are the messenger RNAs again. And here I pulled out this um, northern blot from um, something I did in 1983. And this just shows that the messenger RNAs on a gel. You can see here there's mostly larger amounts of the smaller ones than the larger ones. And the reason I show that is that, so, our, so these, um, these PCR tests for coronavirus RNA are often done with primers to detect the replicase gene that would be shown here. And just the important thing here is that this will, will, well, this will detect only genome RNA, but sometimes they're also done, I think they're usually done with both, with nucleocapsid primers, which would detect all of the uh, RNAs. So when interpreting these kind of data, you might expect that um, if, you're, if you're detecting only genome, that um, this primer will detect every RNA strand, but if you're detecting infected cells, um, the nucleocapsid primer is gonna detect um, all, of, all of the messenger RNAs, whereas the replicase will only detect genome. So um, I would expect this kind of detection to be more sensitive because uh, there's a lot more of these smaller RNAs than the replicase. Okay, so then once we have uh, the RNAs, I wanna talk a little bit about translation. So each RNA is translated into its five prime gene shown here. So, um, uh, and occasionally there are two overlapping Oprah reading frames encoded by one RNA. Um, but uh, these, this part of the genome shown here it encodes uh, a whole, like I said, 16 non-structural proteins, and these contain all the complicated, all the enzymes that are needed to carry out this really complicated transcription and replication um, mechanisms. Um, and, and this is also interesting. So there's, um, there's a translation from the five prime end to synthesize PP1A, which stops around here. And on some, at some, maybe 20% of the time, this um, translation, tr Cease, fails to terminate and translates all the way through here to the end of ORF1B, translating uh, polypeptide 1A, 1B. And this ratio of 1A and 1A, 1B is governed by a frame shift sequence. And what that is, it's a structure um, in the RNA called a pseudonaut, looks sort of like this, such that when the ribosome is translating, it, it comes around here and comes to the termination codon and stops here at the end of ORF1A. But in some cases, because of this structure, the ribosome stalls and kind of slips back one frame. So it's now translating in the minus one frame and continues through to translate um, or 1A, 1B. And the ratio of these two proteins is pretty important because if this is disturbed, it, it's, it's one way to attenuate the virus. So I keep thinking of that as a possible um, antiviral strategy to, to uh, disturb this ratio here. Okay, so I want to talk about these proteins in more detail now, the uh, NSP, uh, <clears throat> the non-structural proteins encoded in ORF1A and ORF1B. The, the ones, the uh, first NSP3 encodes a papain-like protease that, um, that processes by cleaving at these first two sites here to cleave off NSP1 and NSP2. Then there's a 3C-like protease uh, that's called the main protease that processes the rest of these polyproteins here. And then there's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or RDRP, that's um, shown here, that's encoded in NSP12. Um, and this is, this is uh, the, the enzyme that replicates the genome and uh, transcribes the mRNAs. So all of these proteins have been, uh, dis been discussed as antiviral uh, targets, and remdesivir that everyone's heard about that just had some good news this week uh, would be targeting the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, there's some uh, HIV uh, protease, anti-protease drugs that, would, that have been used to target the 3C-like protease. I'm not, I don't think they've been really proven to work or not work uh, to, to date. So um, in, in um, summary, uh, this shows that there are proteases that process replicase proteins and an RNA RD, RDP that replicates genome and transcribes mRNAs. And all three of these are potential targets for antivirals. This is the one that's really been targeted the most. But, um, but these aren't the only targets. There are really uh, many more. Oh, I, li I listed these, uh, col these colleagues here because all of these people, I want to give them credit for having worked on antivirals really between this, the MERS and SARS epidemics now. So 
um, they were kind of prepared for this somewhat and uh, they're actively working on antivirals now, all of those guys. Um, so there are also several other uh, enzymes that also are important for replication, a primase, a helicase, and another activator enzyme. And all of these are, um, are required for uh, RNA replication. There are also, there's also this XON that I mentioned before. It's the proofreading enzyme. If this enzyme is mutated, it also causes uh, quite an extensive attenuation. Endou is an, is an enzyme that um, when mutated results in the uh, accumulation of a lot of double-stranded RNA, which I'll talk about in a minute, and that um, will activate antiviral pathways. So this is an um, interferon antagonist. And then there are these two mRNA capping enzymes here that um, are required for capping uh, and, it, and uh, the uh, messenger RNA, which is really important for it being recognized to, to be translated. Um, and then there are two, also two other proteins, NSP1 and NSP3, that have multiple uh, additional host antagonist activities. So um, this virus really, it has a lot of enzymes needed to promote synthesis and stability of viral RNAs and capping of five prime ends and also the protection from uh, host cell sensors um, and interferon responses. Here's an example of how one uh, compound might be antiviral against all or several or all coronaviruses. Um, so this is the NSP13, the helicase, and uh, this is the molecular models of the helicases of SARS-CoV-1. Uh, COVID this is the original SARS, MERS, and MHV, mouse hepatitis virus. Um, and this shows that uh, this compound, SYA10001, binds into the same binding pocket of all three of uh, these structures shown here. And it also is antiviral against all three of these viruses. So this is all tissue culture uh, experiments in which um, shows that, that uh, the replication of each virus shown here on the y-axis is reduced as, or as a function of um, increased concentration of this compound. So this is just uh, a, a sort of an example of how um, certain uh, potential antiviral drugs can be used against uh, multiple viruses. And this is a really, um, I think, a really good approach looking forward to, to future epidemics as well as, well as um, the current one. So just to um, summarize this part of the talk, there are many conserved features of coronaviruses, and these include the subgenomic uh, messenger RNAs, uh, the non-continuous RNA synthesis, the ORF1A, 1B frame shifting, um, the, uh, then as the actual proteins, the proteases, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, uh, the RNA-modifying enzymes, um, and the further host antagonist uh, activities. So all of these um, can be considered as possible targets uh, when looking, when screening for antiviral compounds as, as lots of people are doing right now. So the last part of the talk is gonna be on coronavirus uh, innate immune an antagonism. Just a review of double-stranded activated antiviral pathways. So when uh, RNA viruses infect the cell, they make double-stranded RNA, and that's, that's part of their replication cycle, as I, as I showed you before. So that's necessary for replicating genome and, and transcribing RNAs. And in fact, um, working with some colleagues, we found that um, some DNA viruses also generate double-stranded RNA. And uh, this RNA is really seen as a danger signal to the host cell. And it's picked up or sensed by several sensors, for example, MDA5 or RIGI. Coronaviruses are recognized only by MDA5 and not RIGI. Um, and that triggers uh, through uh, MAVs and uh, to induce interferon type 1 and type 3 interferons. And those induce interferon stimulated genes, which have many antiviral activities and restrict viral replication and spread. But, and in addition to, to this uh, kind of canonical pathway, there are a couple of other pathways that respond to double-stranded RNA. Uh, the pathway that we've studied a lot in my lab, in fact, it's become a really major topic of our research, is the oligodenylate uh, synthetase RNA cell pathway. In this pathway, um, the double-stranded RNA is sensed by several oligodenylate synthetase uh, proteins, which then synthesize two prime, five prime oligodenylates. This is a small, two prime, five prime linked um, oligoadenylate that uh, is pretty unusual structure. And the only function we know of that is to activate, to cause dimerization and activate of, ribon of ribonuclease L, which then cleaves single-stranded RNA, both viral and host RNA, 
which leads to, again, is antiviral, but also leads to protein synthesis inhibition and induction of apoptosis. Um, in addition, there's the PKR pathway. Uh, PKR is sense, is senses double-stranded RNA. It autophosphorylates and then phosphorylates EIF2 alpha, which is um, a, an initiation factor for protein synthesis, and that again inhibits protein synthesis. So both of these pathways are parallel to um, to the interferon pathway, but they're also induced or upregulated by interferons. So um, they are uh, so when interferon is synthesized, these pathways are even super induced. Um, and so viruses want to uh, try to um, to to shut down all of these pathways, really. And a lot of viruses are successful at shutting down interferon signaling at various uh, steps of, of of the pathway. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about one story from coronaviruses in which they completely shut down this pathway, the OAS RNA cell pathway. They also shut down the interferon pathway. Um, and, uh, and this is done by a, a specific enzyme called phosphodiesterase, that, direct diesterase that's encoded by some coronaviruses, but not all of them. And I'll show you here. So these are coronavirus 2 prime, 5 prime phosphodiesterases. They're encoded by the lineage A coronaviruses, the MHV and OC43. Also lineage C coronaviruses, as exemplified by MERS coronavirus, and also by Turo viruses that are another kind of nidovirus related to coronaviruses. And interestingly, these phosphodiesterases are, are encoded in three different parts of the genome. Uh, here, it's, these are both accessory proteins, whereas this is part of the replicase gene. To characterize these um, phosphodiesterases just a little bit, here's um, a list or uh, homologies or sequences of a bunch of uh, phosphodiesterases, and they're actually found in just about every organism. So these are cellular enzymes, ACAP7, which um, there's a whole family of ACAPs, but ACAP7 in particular has a phosphodiesterase in, in, at its middle segment. Um, and then, uh, then a bunch of coronaviruses that have phosphodiesterases. And the only other, um, oh, I should say that uh, they, they're characterized by two um, HXTSX motifs shown here, about 90 amino acids uh, apart. But there's very, not a whole lot of other homology in the proteins other than these motifs. And I was started to say that um, the only other virus that encodes phosphodiesterase like this are rotaviruses, which are completely unrelated to coronaviruses. So that's kind of a curiosity in itself. We have structures now for ACAP7. This was published before we started working on it. Uh, we published this with collaborators, the crystal structure of MHV2, and this is a predicted structure. And if we uh, lay them on top of each other, they're all quite homologous. So we have these very similar structures of phosphodiesterases for um, several coronaviruses in addition to cellular enzymes and rotavirus. So the NS2 of MHV is encoded here in, in ORF2A. Uh, here it has these two histidines, the catalytic histidines, and we obtained from a collaborator from Stuart Siddell in uh, Britain, two, originally two viruses, a wild type and one with an inactivated phosphodiesterase NS2H126R. Um, this is the A59 strain of MHV, so we'll just refer to it as A59 when we have wild type virus. We tried to replicate these viruses in bone marrow derived macrophages, and we used these cell types because we suspected there was some uh, interaction with interferon pathways, and these viruses have uh, robust interferon uh, responses. And of course, and we saw that while well, wild type virus replicated quite well, this is a log scale to six logs of six uh, logs of plaque forming units. Um, the mutant virus barely replicated at all. Um, when we did the same experiment in uh, macrophages derived from RNA cell knockout mice, the mutant virus recovered, reco recovered replication and replicated quite well, um, suggesting that, that um, NS2 was required for, um, for shutting down the RNA cell pathway. Uh, the same uh, data were obtained when we um, substituted NS2 um, for NS4B from MERS, or the OC43 NS2. And uh, this shows here the way we assay RNA cell, uh, and, and that's by degradation of ribosomal RNA. And we can see that in wild type infected cells, A59, 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 or mock infected cells, you can see 28 and 18 S RNA largely intact, whereas in the mutant infected cells, you can see that it's actually um, degraded, shown here. 
So that this means uh, RNA cell is activated. Um, we did the same experiment in a mouse. So in our mouse model, we infect mice. Um, the virus replicates during the first week or so, and then is cleared by the T cells. Um, during the early parts of infection, the innate immune response is, is really important uh, to, pr to protect the mouse. And um, when we looked at the titers in the liver, so this is the hepatitis model, um, when we uh, titer virus from the liver at uh, day five post-infection here, we see quite a lot of replication, about seven, 10 to the seven uh, platforming units of virus, whereas with the wild type virus, whereas almost, almost no replication at all with the mutant. And again, like with the cells in the absence of RNA cell, the, um, the mutant virus recovers replication completely really. Um, and this is the same thing again with NS4B or OC43. We looked here at uh, liver sections. They're stained for viral antigen. We can see robust antigen uh, for wild type virus in either wild type or mutant mice. Whereas the mutant virus, we see really no detectable antigen in the wild type mice, but, um, but quite a lot equal to the wild type in the knockout mice. And the same thing for, um, for viral uh, induced CPE. We see cytopathic effect and inflammation in wild type uh, and mutant mice with wild type virus and only in mutant mice with um, the mutant virus. So this, this just uh, is consistent with what we showed for replication. So in summary, uh, double-stranded RNA is um, sensed by OAS, which synthesizes 2,5A. And in the presence of the phosphodiesterase, um, it fails to activate um, fails to activate and dimerize RNA cell uh, and virus replication proceeds. Um, this was recently shown, a similar thing was recently shown for, um, for rotavirus, that, that this is uh, the PDE of rotavirus is required for replication in vivo or for pathogenesis in vivo. I just wanna summarize what we know about SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 accessory proteins. They're shown here. There are some interesting differences. Uh, ORF3 is a channel protein. Um, but we, but, and there, this ORF3B seems to be not expressed by uh, SARS-CoV-2. The ORF6 protein um, is, interferes with nuclear translocation of STAT1 in SARS. We don't know its function in SARS-CoV-2, where my lab is particularly interested in this. It has some differences uh, between the proteins. This ORF-A protein seems to change with the adaptation to humans. It was originally um, an ORF-8 in SARS, and then uh, after time, kind of mutated into an ORF 8A, 8B proteins. Uh, right now, the, the new coronavirus has ORF 8 only, but it may also uh, mutate. We don't, we're looking at that. Everybody's looking at that. And there's a maybe there's an ORF 10 protein, which would be specific for um, SARS-CoV-2, but that really hasn't been verified completely yet. So we're very interested in knowing when, whether any of these uh, differences uh, are important for uh, host defense. So just to summarize this part, um, coronaviruses um, are adept at antagonizing innate immune responses. Uh, each lineage of virus encodes a unique accessory proteins that antagonize antiviral response. And I didn't really talk about that here, but there's often redundancy in function. So that, uh, for example, there's another protein called N well, endou that I mentioned. If you knock out that protein, you also get RNA cell uh, activation. So both uh, endou and NS2 are required to really shut down that pathway. Um, lineage B coronaviruses encode 2 prime 5 prime phosphodiesterases that antagonize RNA cell. And for MHV is an organ-specific virulence factor. I didn't show this, but NS2 is not required for replication in the brain, the other um, target of MHV A59. And the SARS coronavirus accessory protein shows some differences from SARS-CoV, um, and we really still don't know whether uh, this is significant for pathogenesis. So models for coronavirus pathogenesis. So the easiest way to work with these viruses is in human lung-derived uh, cell lines, which we do all the time now. Um, we've started to look at primary lung cells with some collaborators at Penn. Uh, lots of people are making mouse models. I'm sure that the, to, the way to do this is to express the human ACE2 in a mouse that my, uh, the viruses don't naturally infect mice. So in order to make a mouse model, there have to be some um, introduction of the human ACE2 receptor uh, and or adaptation of the virus to the mouse. Uh, there are now hamster, ferret, and non-human primate, primate models that, are, that look like they're promising. Um, and there's also the bat. Now the bat is really interesting. 
because bats are the host for many, many um, virulent human viruses, but don't seem to make the bats very sick. So um, we've been working with a collaborator in Colorado who has a, a, a bat colony. Here's a picture of the bat. Um, and he's done infections with MERS and SARS-CoV. This is Tony Shounce at Colorado State. And um, so he's now infected his uh, bats with SARS-CoV-2. And this is just an ELISA showing that um, at day 21, he gets some tighter of, of um, anti antibodies against the nucleocapsid protein to SARS-CoV-2. He sees it by two weeks post-infection. So these mice don't get, very, don't get sick. Um, so we're very interested in understanding more about uh, the host response in the bat. And I will stop here. Um, this is my lab. Uh, right now, the, the, the people that are bolded here are working hard in the BSL-3 on SARS-CoV-2. I'm really proud of them. Um, and uh, this is our collaborator, Bob Silverman. We've done all, almost all our RNA cell work with him. We've collaborated with Ralph Barrick as well on MERS. And I also mentioned Tony Shouts uh, with the bat colony. And that's it. So any questions? How is an intermediate species different from a reservoir species in the context of uh, coronavirus? I, I guess I think of it as a, as a short, more short-term reservoir. It doesn't actually, like if you surveyed civets all over China, you probably, I, don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think you find, you're not going to find a high prevalence of, of SARS-like viruses, whereas the camels, it really lives in the camels. It really is endemic in the camels. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. Can any of the animal coronaviruses um, be used as models for respiratory infections? Okay, so MHV1 causes a severe SARS-like disease. That's one of the MHVs. And we actually worked with that at one time. So, and several of my colleagues at Penn are interested in setting that up. So that is a model. Um, I don't know of any of the other ones that have actually been used as models for, uh, for, for, uh, for SARS. That mouse hepatitis virus is uh, one that veterinarians uh, don't like to see in their uh, animal quarters. Uh, do they have to be uh, uh, studied in, under very uh, controlled conditions? No, actually not. They're actually BSL-1 pathogens because they don't affect humans. But we have a special room and they're isolated. But, but the strains that we work with, A59 and JHM, they have to be injected. The strains that are endemic in, in animal colonies are, are oral fecal strains. They're different strains completely. Nobody really works on those strains, I think probably for those reasons. And when there are outbreaks in, in um, animal colonies, there are never our viruses. They're always like from Jackson Labs or something. They're from the, the vendors. They're not, they're not from our, our mice. So no, we don't have, we do have an isolators in our separate room, but but it's not uh, really dangerous for other mice. It doesn't, it doesn't go from cage to cage even. Uh, here's a question. Why are children less likely to have symptoms when infected with the coronavirus? Uh, is this related to their immune response? Okay, nobody really knows why. There's a lot of speculation, but, but recently there have been a couple reports about pretty bad disease, maybe like Kawasaki-like diseases in children from this associated with this virus. So I think that, um, that maybe that's not completely true. That's been the, the um, belief, and that was true for SARS, that kids didn't get very sick. So I think the data is still coming out on that. Does the Italian strain of the virus differ from the original Wuhan uh, isolate? Yeah, I don't know specifically. I, I would say it doesn't. Um, that I don't, you know, there have been a bunch of, so, so let, me, let me back up for a second. Coronaviruses um, have quasi-species, like all RNA viruses. They make lots of mistakes in their, in, their, in their genome RNA. So if you were to sequence many, many genomes, you'd find lots of random mutations all, all over them. Uh, so it's very hard. You, you'd only really see a strain difference when you see something coming up again and again and again. And I don't think that's really happened yet. I don't think the Italian uh, virus can be differentiated that way from, from the Wuhan virus. Is there any potential value in considering therapeutic targets that are specific to SARS-CoV-2, such as peptides or small molecules that specifically bind or block the activated fusion peptide? Probably, yeah, I would think yes. Um, there have been, there, you mean like heptide, there were heptide repeat peptides that have been used with other viruses. Um, yeah, I think, I think there is value. And it's probably, at this point with this virus, there's probably value in trying every, every uh, approach we can think of, really. So yeah, I think yes.
what are your thoughts on the uh, possibility of developing an RNA vaccine? Well, it's being it's in trial now, so <laughs> I don't really have any. I, I'm not I'm not a vaccinologist. So I it's I think it probably has a chance. It's I guess there's never been one before that's been uh, used, but um, it's being tried. So in fact, people at Penn are, are very interest, very involved in that um, technology. There's another comment. It seems unlikely that this um, virus was uh, quote developed in a laboratory. It wasn't. Uh, no. Yeah, I mean, can't, I'll tell you why. It's it's very similar to SARS, but it's different all across the genome, and and it doesn't resemble any known backbone of a coronavirus. So, it, it just seems impossible that somebody could figure out something that would be this this horrible. Really, it just seems uh -huh. not not possible. There uh, may be five hundred or more bat coronaviruses. How many human transfers have been? documented. Who knows? Well, the, I think the only three we really know of are these three. Um, some of the human, like 2290, the human virus, there are 2290 like alpha, alpha coronaviruses in bats, but we haven't actually documented it in that sense of, you know. Is there concern of recombination between MERS and SARS-CoV-2 in patients who are unfortunate enough to be infected with both? Well, I think that's unlikely since MERS is in the, you mean in the Middle East, um, with the new one. Um, there aren't that many people infected with MERS. I, I think they're probably two different. One's an alpha and one's a beta. I'm, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, B and C lineage. I, I, don't, I don't think they'd recombine, but I'm not, I can't be sure. I would guess no. How confident uh, can we be of the denominator used to determine the lethality in R0 of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and MERS? I think um, not. I think not. We can't be very confident of the, lethal of the denominator because, I mean, especially now when it's coming out of all these, um, uh, you know, asymptomatic infections. And there's some surveys, like in New York, and 20% of the people they surveyed had had been infected. So I think not confident. Thinking about uh, children having less severe disease, um, is it possible that ACE2 is expressed to a lesser extent in children? Um, and uh, can this be studied in models of immature uh, animals? Uh, I don't know if ACE2 is, that's probably known. You could pro probably know from humans, but I, but I, I don't think the premise that more ACE2 means more infection is necessarily correct. It could be that um, you need a sort of a certain amount of ACE2 and more is not gonna infect any better. So I'm not convinced that that would be a major factor, but it could be. So on testing, uh, how can one be sure that the test is for SARS-CoV-2? Um, the RNA testing seems to be pointed to unique regions with the CDC trying for three. Um, and similarly, looking for antibodies, how do you make certain you're not picking up a response to something earlier? Well, well, the, the, the PCR test is pretty specific. I mean, we, we actually have MERS in our lab and we can you know, do that. Um, those primers are picked out for SARS-CoV-2. Also, there's like nobody's had SARS-CoV-2 before this, anything that's close enough. So, you know, I'm pretty confident of that. As far as the antibodies go, I don't think that anybody, I mean, nobody has antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 pre-existing. I don't think that any of the other coronaviruses are going to cross-react. That's my, yeah, I don't think so. Because everybody, I think most people have had OC43, for example, or it's very common. And I don't think you see antibodies from OC43 confusing the test with SARS. If there isn't an Italian strain, how can they conclude that the New York infections are, uh, were originated in Italy? Okay, so maybe I'm using the word strain differently. I would think there are certain markers and changes that, are, that will be in the viruses from Italy. So they'll find those in New York. I guess what I meant by strain was it's not biologically behaving differently, but there may be certainly be markers in it that may be different. Are there any known micro RNAs that facilitate SARS-CoV-2 replication similar to MIR-122 that plays a role in regulation of uh, hepatitis C virus. Um, not that I, I, well, certainly no one knows about that yet for this virus. I don't 
think that was shown for any of the other coronaviruses, but I, I, I could have missed it, but I don't think so. Does um, uh, uh, ribosomal RNA cleavage occur while the viral RNA is being translated? And does this only happen in some cell types? So this is interesting. Even when the ribosomes are cleaved, when the ribosome is cleaved, there's enough protein and structure keeping them together that they can still translate. I've been told that. But, um, it do, so the, the, but the whole process doesn't activate in some cell types, like for example, neurons. And I think it's because the, the level of OASs are, is too low. And so you just don't get activation. It's most robust in myeloid cells. So uh, could this uh, relate then to the pathogenesis and broad range of symptoms of the, of the virus? Well, I don't know how, I don't, I don't, well, I don't know that, we don't know anything about RNA cell. I should have, I, I didn't say this directly. I should have. SARS-CoV-2 doesn't have this um, phosph phosphodiesterase, and we don't know if it activates RNA cell, but it's something that we're going to find out about like tomorrow. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> and uh, will the accumulating viral gene mutations threaten the effectiveness of, of a new vaccine? Okay, that's, I don't think so because, <clears throat> I mean, these are kind of random mutations. And, and the only kind of, I mean, an, an antibody escape mutant might do that. If, if um, like if the vaccine were just monoclonal, maybe viruses could escape from it. But I don't think that random changes, there, unless, unless at all, I don't think random changes are going to change the antigenicity or the neutralizing epitopes on the spike. There'd have to be some selection to push that. So, yeah. Do you have thoughts on what accounts for the propensity for the respiratory uh, cell? Well, it's got ACE2 on it. I mean, they, I don't know. There are ACE2 in other cell types as well, so I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it gets there first, it gets through the nose and goes down. I don't, I don't know. And uh, uh, what about um, the propensity for thrombosis, vascular thrombosis? That's that, been... I don't know. That's been coming out. I don't know. Maybe it infects. I'm not sure. That's going to, lots of people are going to look at that. Yes, I think you're right. Okay. Well, um, I think we've gotten almost everything here. I want to thank you again so much for taking the time. To, uh, this was a terrific presentation. We all learned a lot. And uh, congratulations on uh, uh, wonderful science. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.